Stephen. Andrew. Do you fancy spending a quiet night inside number nine? Of course. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, mate. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not going to beat about the bush. It's Christmas. Uh, this is the first time we've been able to do a proper Christmas special where we date the episode, you know, appropriately because we have a Christmas special episode of Inside Number Nine to talk about, uh, which aired last night. So, yeah, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> No one, no one was questioning it. <laughs> that, feels quite, uh, that feels quite aggressive. Sorry, sorry, and no one's complained. Yeah, I'm. I just feel <laughs> like it's it's just nice to be able to record, you know, a Christmas episode, and it it to feel like there's there's something appropriate to talk about because uh, the bones of Saint Nicholas um, was directed by George Kane, produced by Kim Crowther, written by Steve Pemberton and Rhys Shearsmith, and it first aired on Thursday the 22nd of December 2022. And it's a Christmas special. Standalone episode at the start of Series 8. Uh, series 8, Episode 1. Does that mean we've got another six episodes after this then? Or five, the Series 8? Probably. Or is it... I, yeah. Is, well, I, uh, is this like Devil of Christmas was? I think so, like a, a kind of prelude to series three devil of christmas was series three yeah, yeah i think so um and then the rest will follow at some point later in the year but we weren't alive to well the podcast wasn't alive to, <laughs> <laughs> for that moment what? with devil of christmas so we, we like this is new territory for us isn't it so it is so dr parkway's late wife booked him in for a champing stay at an old church he wants to be left to his thoughts and memories, but unfortunately for him, a plethora of characters just won't leave him have a moment's peace. Turns out the stories are perhaps trying to warn him, but about what? A champing stay. <laughs> Sounds awful. <laughs> champing is apparently a thing. I, I had doubts, but then people do anything these days, don't they? Anything. And so we were talking before we started recording about portmanteaus that are not e equal in their sort of division of labor. <laughs> and I think this is an example of that because it would at least be chum chumping or churm chirping. Chirping. That sounds because, like a completely different thing. And I mean, it does, it sounds worrying, whatever it is, but like chumping you, all you've done is added the H. Yes. That's not enough as far as no, I'm concerned. No, But then the words aren't equal in length either to start with. Should there be like a proportional representation of each word in the portmanteau? It's no. got to be, in the, it's got to be in, in the same ratio of... That's, what, that's, do you have any better suggestions for this particular one? No, I'll let you know if anything suddenly comes to me. Yeah. Likewise, if anyone has any uh, any better portmanteaus, then send them to uh, the Church of England at <laughs> gmail dot com. <laughs> oh, excuse me, I've just been draining a kidney. You're Mr. Parkway, I take it. Uh, Doctor Parkway, yes. You must be Mr. Wilson. Oh, call me Dick. Everyone does. <sighs> so, have you ever been champing before? Sorry, champing. Camping in a church, that's what we call it, though it does have unfortunate connotations of someone eating with a mouthful. <laughs> ah, no, I, I haven't actually. My wife booked this as a Christmas present, but sadly... As I'm sure you're aware, it costs a pretty penny to preserve these buildings, and champing is our biggest money spinner. Yeah, thoughts on this episode? Let's just go in with... And I feel like, you know, with a Christmas special... There's a different expectation. There's a different need, a kind of a, a different spirit with which you receive a TV show. Maybe is that the case for you? Yeah, I guess. I guess it's a bit different with an anthology program, anyway, because it doesn't really matter. I I know that when I'm watching a when with series, I generally like a Christmas one to be able to be watched as a standalone one, and I will cycle through and watch the Gavin and Stacey Christmas special 
just at Christmas time and the office and all of those sorts of things because yeah you're right there is an expectation there but I I guess with this it doesn't really matter it doesn't need to be part of an arc because it's a standalone anyway and I I didn't really expect I didn't have any certain expectations around it being a Christmas one other than seeing the title and seeing Bones of St Nicholas and it's not like the Devil of Christmas was something different that stands outside of the rest of them no. as far as I'm concerned anyway like and I was thinking along the same lines really yeah were you not no I was I was but the the different because I love the devil of Christmas but I didn't see it at Christmas so I like I don't know what time of year was mm. the first time I saw that but it wasn't a problem not seeing it at Christmas and I don't think this one would be either um, but I thought it was just a magnificently chilling mm. episode. It was one, you know, I sent you a message afterwards, like, that was intense. Like, it was massively sort of, what's going to happen here? Very much uh, so, yeah, so well written. As I think just, I I love the telling of ghost stories and mm. the ability of certain people to tell a story in a way that just keeps you on tenterhooks. And certainly with Simon Callow involved in that, it was just like, this is a oh. beautiful experience of receiving ghost stories in a way that just, and, and Reese um, as Pierce, like was almost my receiving like he, he played, <laughs> yeah he just played that role so well of like yes that's me <laughs> you're, do, you're I, doing it there's a big gap in my notes when that at the point when the story was being told not because there was nothing to write down but because at that point i was just sort of captivated i was mm-hmm. just so into that ghost story <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. It's and it's so horrible so good. <laughs> <laughs> it's horrible tongue yeah. hanging down So the start is like this cold, wintry scene, a church, graveyard. There's Jasper um, wandering through the graveyard towards this church. A uh, bit of haunting music, a bit of music reminiscent of that stake out, how do you plead? Um, mm-hmm. And what's the one on the lake? Merrily, merrily. Merrily, merrily. That sort of Christian Henson string thing that alludes to something supernatural. Um, that and also with is there him him there lit up sort of at an angle with his briefcase, looking a bit exorcisty. Yes, nice. Yeah, and it was a really nice shot. That yeah. actually with the light on him, the, the whole place looks beautiful. Yeah, especially with the snow falling on it as well. It's a really nice setting. Yeah. And I think with the kind of the blurb that they'd given ahead of time, the suggestion is we're going into a church, expect ghosts. Three of them. <laughs> There's something quite amazing about um, C of E churches at Christmas in the way that they managed to look very sparse yet very cozy at the same mm. time especially with that tree up at the front it it's weird it does look cozy yet very bare cold it's nice no, it's not the sort of place you'd maybe want to stay the night but no and that was that was the confusing bit without knowing what was going on here he arrives to find a bed made up <laughs> what what was going on here yeah on pew number nine pew number nine I've never seen a pew numbered <laughs> like you? like a gig. <laughs> yeah, no, I've pew seen nine pew. seat. <laughs> I think a theme of this episode might be um, the fact that my dad was a vicar, and I'm kind of familiar with <laughs> certain aspects of this episode. Feel very close to home. Um, we'll get into that in the bell tower. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, keep listening. <laughs> ladies and gents um you've been you've been, <laughs> yeah. you've been working on the audience retention stuff since our last episodes 
<laughs> yeah, pews were numbered. Were they? Yeah. Why? Why? What's the purpose? Just so you don't lose one, I suppose. I, yeah. <laughs> every <laughs> something's missing. <laughs> Who, something's. Are all the pews here? Come on. <laughs> Unfortunately, they're always there, and they're very uncomfortable. <laughs> um, yeah. So that was and. Not the most appetizing. Is that the right word? Like what? When you see a bed, it's not appetizing. It's inviting. Sort of inviting. Is that a cloak that he puts his hat on, or is that just really horrible-looking sleeping materials? Oh, it's well, like a red. It. The red material. He put. I don't. I'm like. He puts his hat on it. I'm not sure whether it's sort of, yeah, maybe not important, but whether he brought his own cloak, I don't know. Well, maybe he was <laughs> panning, just wandering around in a red cloak, <laughs> pretending <laughs> to be the ghost of St. Nicholas. I don't know. <laughs> Could have been, yeah. So, yeah, that the sort of introduction finishes, and he's also wandering around sort of running his hands over the relief Intr- carvings really on the tomb. interesting isn't it yeah in a way that is more than just sort of getting a feel for, you, you know how you might like or not on a tomb no not maybe not on i a tomb. don't i wouldn't do that on a tomb no you might be right <laughs> there was a, a line later on with um where pierce talks about um da vinci code and mm. it did make me think a bit of that it, before that line had even been said, when he runs really? his hands over it, I thought some bad CGI was going to come <laughs> come up where he was joining some stuff together. And actually, that kind of happens not with bad CGI, but with relief rubbings <laughs> later on. Yeah. And then we meet Dick. So it's, it's great when he's sort of like, as long as people pay, pay their overnight fee, anyone's welcome into the church. Like, <laughs> yeah. I thought that was the case anyway with the church. Like, <laughs> anyone's welcome. <laughs> As long as they pay their overnight fee. What? <laughs> and he's got his swiper. His a lovely swiper. Touch. It, it must be expensive because <laughs> the wireless limit is now, uh, cardless limit thing is now 100 quid, isn't it? It is. So now, it must be yeah. pricey for hanging out in this church. And, and, I think, and it can't be that old because he mentioned Wordle. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> which like, dated this, it. Is, this is not a pre Wordle world. <laughs> so, yeah. Hundred pounds is certainly the limit at this point. Um, yeah. So the so <laughs> Canon Berryman eighty five <laughs> got a Wordle in too. So I was I was really pleased to hear the reference to Wordle, given our previous references to Wordle and yeah, and Nindle. Yeah, which has disappeared. Unfortunately, oh, has it? Yeah, I I kept trying to play it, and I've I've been meaning to. St- 17 days in a row. <laughs> I've been meaning to uh, say to um, Rob that um, I was disappointed to see that he didn't keep up his subscription. <laughs> or however, I don't know how you host those things, but I was playing every day and it just it's disappeared. Yeah, Aww. so I was disappointed. I've set up your bed here. Some churches put a full-size Queen Anne in the transept, but speaking personally, I don't think it's fitting. I said to Canon Berryman, I said, we're not an air B and B. No, Dick, he said, we're a prayer C of E. <laughs> 85 and sharp as a blade. Then it's time. I've seen him do a wordle in two Dick cut him off when he was initially mm. trying to mention about his wife. And then he pushed it through again later when, when Dick then asked, is your wife going to be joining you? And he made some comment about her passing away and this had been a gift from her. And <laughs> Dick offered to void the whole transaction and start again. No, it's okay. <laughs> Please. <laughs> yeah, which is, it raises some interesting questions about the relationship between Dick and Jasper or like Dick's expectation of who Jasper might be, Mm -hmm. even in the fact that he's double booked the, you know, the two lots because yeah. And we, we can, we can get into this as we sort of unpack the story as it goes. But I, I think there's more to that, and there's more to what Dick is expecting from this evening than meets the eye, given the fact he's very, very close 
and probably sleeping or just well, yeah, he, um, staying, he, sitting somewhere very, very close by. He suddenly comes back in, doesn't he? Like yeah. it's, it's not necessarily after the... He comes back after the phone call because they've seen the ghost. But before that, he just wanders back in, doesn't he? To say, should we have a sherry? Oh, when he's up the bell tower, yeah. Mm. Yeah. And also, I mean... He Jasper seems incredibly insincere when he says the line about spending the night alone with his thoughts and memories. There's nothing heartfelt about that line delivery at all. No. Spend the spend the night alone with my thoughts and memories. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's, it was a classic Steve Pemberton delivery of yes. like something there's something beneath this. Yeah. Yes. And you're wondering, is he lying about his wife? Actually I noticed later on he does have a wedding ring on. Oh, does so, it? So, yeah, maybe there is a a wife either alive or dead. But it's interesting in the next scene where, you know, he, he doesn't talk mom. about his wife, it's, he talks about his mum. And obviously they could both be dead. And it's not necessarily a, he's just changed his story. But Maybe it's like, his wife booked, or oh, that would be a weird romantic getaway <laughs> to the church where your mum's buried outside. <laughs> Yeah. For the two yeah, of us. Exactly. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. And then this scene ends with, um, I'm sure you won't be alone. Merry Christmas, mm. Dr. Park- Parkway. And God bless us, everyone. <laughs> and this is kind of setting up this expectation along with the blurb in the Radio Times or whatever. This is. We're talking about ghosts. You know, it's, it's, it's a Christmas quite, carol. It's- exactly. Like, I don't think it's pretending to be anything else other than a ghost story which is why yeah. it's quite interesting what it becomes because it isn't necessarily mm. a ghost story no uh, but we'll get into the differences between ghosts and premonitions um as we go i'm sure so um yeah scene three he gets out his maps and sets to work what were you he? thinking when he pulled them out of his bag <laughs> um <laughs> It it was it was this Da Vinci Code thing again. It was this church explorer um, who's after something. It was it was becoming clear that there was something in this church that he was looking for, some sort of mystery that he was trying to unravel. Um, that he clearly had visited other places, and this was part of that journey of discovery. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's, and but sort of yeah more subtle than tom hanks yes like fewer, i said there's fewer <laughs> planes hanging out in the <laughs> yeah. garden to, yeah yeah and then so then there's the yeah there's those sort of haunting jingle bells like again mm-hmm. the music comes in like we we're focused on the christmas tree there's that is that is there the red cloak at this point yes. yeah yeah um which is not obvious on first watch because you just all you see is a Christmas tree, and it could be just like a red frontal on something mm-hmm. behind the Christmas tree or whatever. Um, and then there's this the moment of the the bauble, um, which is massive. Like that's a it is a big bauble. old bauble, it's a big bauble, big baubles. Um, yeah, and and knowing that this was. The title of this, The Ghost of St. Nicholas, or sorry, Bones of St. Nicholas, you see Santa's face and you, there and you think, okay, <laughs> we're off and running. Yeah. <laughs> Here he is. Yeah, that's, and then the reflection in the bauble, the candle blows out, there's sort of a sense of, okay, there's someone else here, or there's the presence of something else here. Um, and then that's interrupted by the door <laughs> opening, in enter Pearson Posey. <laughs> Our lager, which art in barrels, hallowed be thy ale. Thy kingdom come, thy will be drunk, at home as in the tavern. Give us this day our foamy head, and forgive us our spillages, as we forgive those who spill against us. Deliver us not into inebriation, for thine is the stout, the bitter, and the lager, forever and ever, barmen. <laughs> You're not funny enough. Of course I am. Hey, do you want to see my little white balls? <laughs> Pierce's character reminds me straight away a bit of the guy in um, 
Nana's party. Yeah. <laughs> like a younger version. Absolute Pat. Yeah. I made a note of that. And he was so proud of himself. And he is proud of himself with every single line he delivers. <laughs> yeah. I think Pierce <laughs> is quite an appropriate name, you know, just popping, yes. just popping yes. in, like Pierce <laughs> in the moment. Um, it's beautiful. Yeah. So he's, will the old man give them some booze? Because they've obviously had an encounter again with Dick. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure. I, I still can't quite work out how this has all gone as it has. So they've booked online, even though Jasper's booked out for himself. They, the booking has gone through online. Um, and I assume there's some back and forth online, like with your host. Yeah. There's something about a missed email, though, isn't it? Like, Dick said he didn't see an email or something, but but you're you're right. There is something here about the setup with how Dick was dealing with Jasper that suggests this wasn't entirely a mistake. Mm. Maybe he knows that Jasper is Up some sort of relic collector, um, as comes clear or not comes clear but like the 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 kind of encounter that they have around that ghost story and yeah it's quite interesting i mean i assume jasper is quite he must be quite sort of underhand and deceitful and selfish about this whole thing because there's no reason to be this way if you have an inkling and you've he he's trying to keep this to himself, isn't he? He doesn't want anyone else to put all this together. He's spending a lot of time and energy on finding this thing. Yeah. It shouldn't, <laughs> there's no reason this shouldn't be a fairly upfront thing. Um, it's true. Yeah. F- funding through some sort of academic institute to allow you to go around the country hunting this down. I don't really know why it has to be. Yeah like this yeah exactly and another thing because it's like the um it's the first time they've had a booking on christmas eve um oh it's all theater isn't it (laughs) (laughs) and it's one man on his own which is quite strange on a christmas eve and also in a church so obviously enthusiastic about christmas not having like a midnight mass Mm. and not having uh service the following morning on christmas day yeah, that's true yeah so that's quite unusual unless that's been sort of readied by someone like dick who's like yeah we'll we'll catch the guy um, well, when we when we get to the end like his reaction is not one of horror no when he finds what he finds it's no it's like <laughs> yes good not him <laughs> the trap the trap worked perfectly you did it beautifully um yeah it's yeah it's quite funny um but then i'm not sure i'm not sure how how planned out it feels uh even still but no um yeah so like moving on from from where we got to i think we got a little bit sidetracked there uh, or a little bit future tracked a little bit <laughs> Maybe premonitions to the something that we we might. It's not a premonition when you're talking about (laughs) something that happens in the episode you've just watched and you're about to talk about. (laughs) I don't understand these things. I'm confused. I've watched this episode a few times today. (laughs) I'm still confused. Um, (laughs) They, here's his incredible (laughs) humor work is interrupted as. Jasper appears and Posey exclaims, oh my Lord, to which Jasper replies, not quite, I'm afraid. (laughs) He arrives in the morning. (laughs) Beautiful. It's like, yes, that's classic Steve Pemberton delivery of that line as well. Um, And yeah, how he sort of talks about the fact he's got exclusive use of the church until 10am tomorrow. And she's like, use? (laughs) 
<laughs> what, yeah. what do you mean? What does use mean in this use context? Church. <laughs> what are you planning to, to use this church for? Um, and that's when he sort of then goes into the mum is buried in the graveyard. And I wanted to spend the night here in quiet contemplation. It does feel like he's just pulling anything out at this point, though, doesn't it? Yeah. Just something else. Yeah. Um, I like their little side story. The reason why they're there is their Lapland visit was cancelled because there was no snow. And there's no point in going if you can't stay in an igloo. <laughs> you have to stay in a shed. Oh, my Lord! Not quite time afraid. He arrives in the morning. And he gave us a bloody heart attack. Are you the vicar? Uh, no, no. I'm uh, Dr. Parkway, Jasper. And I'm afraid I have exclusive use of this church till 10 a.m. tomorrow. News. I should explain. My mother passed away earlier this year. She's buried out in the graveyard. I simply wanted to spend the night here in quiet contemplation. Oh. And that's what's interesting about this episode is like, whose perspective are we seeing this from? Is it, what are these premonitions? What are these visions? Who is seeing them? How are they seeing them? And... Yeah, are they just stories? They tell themselves patterns that sort of retrofit mm. something. That's true. Um, because even when he, like, we we only see that sort of going back into those moments that we've seen as spooky moments after he's had that accident. Really, um, I think there's like the the bit just before he slips, um, but that's it. And yeah. then, and then it's kind of like, okay, who's telling this story? That is true because, well, I assume it's from him because if you if you think about um, the story that Posey tells, yeah. which kind of sets all that up, that was an experience that she had um, as a forewarning that something bad was about to happen to her. She had that experience of that vision mm. um, that then became an echo of the future yeah whatever um yeah, ended up being um that was her that was her getting a warning and so that was um jasper getting a warning um there was someone mentioned online that this was very much um reminiscent of a horror story written by mr james mm -hmm. um yeah mark gatiss did a whole documentary about mr james oh did he have you seen it yeah and this idea that you almost people are in situations where if they go too far, this could end up happening to them. Mm -hmm. um, and this was him having that warning and, and may, maybe he, that was him. I don't know. Having, having this idea in his mind that something bad could happen here. And he was almost giving himself forewarning and it was yeah. just, in his, it was all in his head as yeah. a sort of a, as a worry what we actually saw there was his inner anxiety manifesting itself as a cloaked red well, figure. And that's, that's what I like about this because it, it is ambiguous. Like it doesn't have a, a completely coherent explanation. Oh, I love that. I love lack yeah. of coherent explanation. I love ambiguous yeah. because it, there's nothing worse than when you try and make it work. And actually it feels like a bit of a letdown mm -hmm. because you go, Oh, it was just that. Yeah. No, no, I think that's it. great. Leave them wanting more. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, I think that's great. Um, and it, yeah, it's, that is really interesting that it's those stories that you tell that then fit, like, because it is the, it's the chilling aspect that like when Posey tells her story and it's like, Ooh, and when Dick tells his story and then Pierce is quick to say, so now do you believe in ghosts? And it's like, well, no, that was a great story. <laughs> but yeah. why, why would that make me believe in ghosts? Like I've had a great time listening to that story. He's a very good storyteller, but that doesn't convince me. No. Um, but part I've, of the fun is. I've, I've read my little girl it. funny bones many times <laughs> and I and I don't think that there are skeletons living in a cellar. <laughs> no matter how many, how well I've read that story, I'm not convinced yeah. <laughs> about skeletons <laughs> living in a cellar. He's such a cynic. <laughs> Always be specific. Rich teas. 
nice, nice, nice biscuit. The worst of nices. That got. I saw someone complaining at Reese about slagging off nice biscuits, nice biscuits. And then there's a quest for a kitchen because obviously there's a lot of lady vicars nowadays. He's so, he's just Pat, isn't he? <laughs> he is Pat. That is a, such is a it, Pat line. This is also after he's eaten all the communion wafers. <laughs> I love that relationship as well. There's something really, really beautiful about the way they are together. You say this, but. <laughs> One of the most horrible moments this episode is where she's just told that story about the accident and the premonition and then the phone rings and they go and pick up the phone and then he tells her it's for her and then goes at her and scares the shit out of her. It's a horrible, horrible thing to do. But, But I thought in the context of an episode where we've got a lot of music, there's a lot of atmosphere, like as viewers we're seeing this differently to how they would be experiencing it in the moment itself where but actually they, that but that but might be got the, the real they've got the real atmosphere from the no, fact no, they've no, just no. been told that ghost story and she's just bared her might, soul about i think that premonition. might be the nice thing to do in that situation because it diffuses that that kind of tension that might have built up like if the problem we're expecting <laughs> ghosts. As viewers, we're expecting ghosts. We're expecting the worst. We're As... expecting ghosts following no, that story and her story about her premonitions. No. As participants no. in that story. <laughs> if someone had done that to me, I would have punched him in the face. <laughs> well, if Christian Henson was providing the soundtrack, maybe that's true. <laughs> if I was wearing in-ear monitors at all times, <laughs> you might stay. But no, I just think that was actually quite a kind thing to do. <laughs> I can sort of see where you're coming from, but absolutely no, not. I think, like, it's a dickish thing to do. Dick move, that is. Like, we, yeah, without doubt, it's a stupid thing to do. But at the same time, it's like, let's let's not sort of get ourselves as twisted into this whole ghost <laughs> thing as we could do if we dwell on it too much. Because as we've explored, you know, five minutes ago, neither of us believe in ghosts. So let's stop thinking about things through that lens so let's use that phone call or that you know Cruel newfangled thing that you know, <laughs> where we're able to I talk that. to other people through the air or whatever newfangled machines where you talk to each other through the air yeah i mean this is also a man that thinks that it's a perfectly sensible explanation that someone called a wrong number at 3 a.m <laughs> that's true <laughs> yeah what, what? like and why like i wouldn't be answering that phone no, absolutely not. Like, it's clearly not for me nope. because nobody knows I'm here. <laughs> Why would what, I answer that? What do you think the end game is of taking that phone call? You go, no, he's not here or he's asleep. Yeah. Call back again in the morning. Exactly. So, uh, you're a religious man then, uh, Jazz? Uh, not particularly, no. It's the building itself I'm most interested in. All right, you're more like a history doctor then, Indiana Jones, Da Vinci Code stuff. You could say that, yes. Yeah, the whole thing was giving me Da Vinci Code vibes right from the off. And it was... Because that ends... That ends with in a church, and that church contains... What is it? Is it the remains of Mary Magdalene or something? Something about yeah, it's because like the, the, because there there are survivors of Jesus's bloodline or something, aren't there? I think a, so. And it turns out there's a child of, of Jesus. There's what? a Jesus, tr- yes, something like that. I can't remember, but that ends in a church, and it's this unassuming church in the English countryside, which contains yeah. not all the French countryside, some it's somewhere um, that contains something really important. That's the link. And that's what this felt like right from the off, um, especially with his rubbings. Yeah. Um, and it turns out very much the same, but without bad CGI floating around. Just a little bit more Santa Claus. Bit more Santa Claus, yes. Tough crowd. <laughs> oh, my good Godfathers. Who is it? I don't know. I just pulled back the curtain and he were there. I thought it was Paul Hollywood. Well, you wouldn't reach out and giving you a handshake, would you? It's St. Nicholas. The original Santa Claus. You mean the Coca-Cola one? Uh, 
little before that, I believe. Well, the horrific face of Paul Hollywood. <laughs> Definitely wouldn't want him to give uh. you a handshake. <laughs> oh, I enjoyed that as well. Yeah, that was nice. And this is... So, Jasper goes into like this weird mode here where it's almost like he sees an opportunity to try and scare him off and get rid. Because he starts sort of gleefully reciting this horrific story um, about the legend of St. Nick, about little boys being chopped up, and chopped off, chopped up and put in salt to cure them. Um, not to make them better, because it wouldn't, um, to sell as meat. Hmm. And then, I don't know, stating is, it as though it's a fact that people often hang pickles on their Christmas trees, which is which something I, I've never heard of. <laughs> I've not, I'd not heard of, and then I went looking, and it seems like it may be, and we would love verification of this, a German thing. This um, sounds like a Simon Woolley moment right now. I'd be interested, like, if this is genuinely something like gherkins or pickles do you hang them on your christmas trees or like <laughs> like symbolic versions of such things um because I have not got i'd not come across little, this the grinch's cock. i have not got a grinch's cock on my christmas tree no and it's a peculiar derivation pickling or preserving of a children's body in salt or vinegar that reminds me did we bring any crisps <laughs> so he's doing his rubbings while Posey gives an amazing rendition of a little town of Bethlehem. <laughs> I've never heard daffodils mentioned. <laughs> no, I, was that? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I, it made me think: is that in the original? Maybe it's version? the maybe it's the really original one. If you date it back far enough, like when uh, the Twelve Days of Christmas had collie birds rather than calling birds, that right. sort of thing. And then there's a, the talk of stockings. Chekhov's noose. There's this ladder in the gusset. <laughs> so there's this moment where Posey's singing sort of disappears. And at that point, when I first watched it, I was like, is she a ghost? Is that oh, what, is that are what's they ghost? Here? Is that Are they a pair of ghosts? And that's what I was wondering. I mean, to be fair, yeah. that would be a good pair of ghosts. A bit like um, Statler and Waldorf in The Muppets Christmas Carol. <laughs> yeah, like... Just a comic they, pair. They have a beautiful sort of... They have a beautiful relationship. They're both wearing pretty similar things. Like, they'd be a perfect pair of ghosts at this oh, stage. Oh, actually, there's a whole story there where they had the tragic loss of a child. Yeah. And as a result, they just decided that they'd be better off together forever. And now they roam empty oh, I did, churches. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. Oh, man. Oh, maybe. Maybe everyone in this church is Everyone's ghosts. a ghost. <laughs> yeah. Even Jasper. Every, literally everyone is a ghost. And Jasper's like a couple of ghosts <laughs> haunting himself. <laughs> like his feedback loop of ghosts. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. Um and yeah, and that's so. It's this moment where like Posey's singing disappears, almost like up the chimney and and away, mm. and then that's where uh, Jasper sort of follows this figure up the bell tower, um, and he can hear someone up there, and it sounds it's like choking, isn't it? There's something about that moment where you're like. Mm. What's he about to find up there? What, and why is he going so willingly? Yes, I would be giving that a wide berth. Yeah, I'd be like, is that where the sun's nope. going? I'm going to go the other nope. way. I'll go the opposite <laughs> Not direction. Not for me. Thank you very much. Yeah. And yeah. She on the floor. She on the floor. And then he just sort of picks it up, places it on the side, and then climbs the ladder. Which he doesn't is, go, this looks like one of mine. Is it is it's it one of there. his is it is it a kind of a shoe that is his or is it like a different sort of shoe to the point where he's like a size nine black shoe <laughs> and this is the thing <laughs> and this is where it becomes sort of a bit like yeah who's where and 
what what's whose going shoe on? is it anyway <laughs> yeah 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 well what you don't like the physical object because we've had physical interactions with the environment like he's not the bauble off he's he's blown out the candlestick like i don't but these are also things that dick does so that so dick picks up the so dick encounters the bauble dick encounters the shoe as if does he yeah oh you mean that later yeah okay so it's like dick goes through this these same experiences so where does where what's the interact what like what's the relationship between dick and jasper in that respect because it yeah mm. it's like because but he's not quite having the exact same experiences is he because the the stuff's going on while dick is there but then dick is responding differently to them like his phones ringing and things like because yeah yeah no it's, they are different the experiences ring. yeah and they are different experiences. That's the thing that's like, because it, it's not, there's not a complete parallel, but there are... Uh, Time travel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, a, it's, a, a, going it's a bit like that. No, 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 no. No, I prefer the supernatural anxiety dreams. <laughs> and that, And that's where it is like with premonitions, and I don't know enough about this sort of folklore where premonitions because it's almost like premonitions are they like the opposite of a ghost in that they lead to the event whereas a ghost is after the event so a ghost is the presence of the absence after the thing has happened whereas a premonition is the presence of this thing until the thing well, happens the weird thing is that if if it's going to be treated as though it's a warning to him not to carry on down this path, does that mean a premonition can cause the future to change? Because can a premonition make you can change it ever, course? Will it ever? Or is that? Or is, is that there any story a, where a premonition ends up with a change other than Chris, a Christmas Carol? A Christmas Carol. There you go. In a Christmas Carol. It does, because he gets to see what would have happened. But I guess that's that sort of answers your question about the difference between ghosts and premonitions, is that they're different ghosts. The ghost of Christmas, Christmas past, the ghost of Christmas present, the ghost of Christmas future or yet to come. And so is this a, a premonition ghost rather than a... It's not a very helpful ghost, because it's not like... It's just... It's literally what he's about to do. Yeah, but that's... So it's, it's kind of like... But, that's, but that's, he doesn't know it's him. So it's like... No, a, that's true. He needs it to sort of arrive in the night and tell him very explicitly what's going on. Yeah, and that's that's where Scrooge has an advantage. <laughs> Scro Scrooge has some very obvious ghosts with no nuance who go, right, I'm your first ghost. I will be Ooh. telling you why you're this way. Yeah. <laughs> I'm from your future. This doesn't have to be the way. <laughs> but you have to change your current <laughs> course of action. All right. I'll give that a go. Whereas for Jasper, it's like, shit, I need to get away from that thing, which is <laughs> me in the future. Oh, my which God. Which is, oh, shit, I've become, <laughs> I've become me of the future. Oh. oh, now I'm dead. But there isn't any necessarily a clue that it's going to end badly either. That's the Apart thing. from the sounds of choking. and <laughs> Yeah, but he doesn't know that's him. No, and legs banging. Because <laughs> he's like, he's searching for someone, perhaps he can help. He could help them by not... By not doing what it... Yeah. <laughs> because that's... So he... It's like when he opens that, like the bell room, the door to the bell room, the sound stops. And then that's when he stumbles on that shoe starts w walking up that ladder, which again created sort of flashbacks for me where the bell room in the church where my dad was the vicar, it was quite a scary, like it was a, it was a big church. It was the bell tower was tall 
So you'd go around and round and round and round and round and round and round up up this tower. You'd get to the bottom room that would, which is where you could control the four small bells. Um, so that's where, like, I used to do a bit of like wedding bell ringing from there. Nice. It was like easy, easy ten quid, and then um, <laughs> you'd go up to the next room. And then you could get up to the like roof and there was a ladder, which was just like the ladder in this episode. Um, but one of the rungs was loose and it spun. So it was like, it was really petrifying to go up because it was similar in that you're a long way up this tower. Mm-hmm. Everything is wooden. Everything creaks. Everything feels like, yeah, this could give way at any moment. You're going up this tiny ladder up to the roof. One rung. You didn't quite know which rung it was, <laughs> but you stepped on it. It's like, okay. The spinny rung. <laughs> which room contained the jaw of Santa Claus is what I want to know right now. <laughs> well, yeah. You know, when he's walking that plank across, yeah. it's like that is literally how these places are made. Like, there's nothing safe. There is nothing safe once you get beyond a certain point in these bell towers. It's just wooden planks that you're trusting. So, for people who do bell ringing as a hobby, to some extent, it's a bit of an adrenaline fueled. (laughs) Well, a lot of bell ringing is done. um, So, that was like solo bell ringing. So, like, I, I would have four bells that I'd have to ring in a certain order a lot of bell ringing is done at i think ground level where people are just like tolling the the big rope yeah that controls one big bell that is like a long way above their head and so there's a lot of momentum that comes with that so you've (laughs) got to be quite strong (laughs) to not get caught up with that um But at the same time, you're not standing on precarious ground when you're doing it. It's solid. Yeah. Um, So for those of you who tuned in this week on Christmas Day to find out about bell ringing, there you go. Would you like to hear about it? Does involve a ghost. Oh, now you're talking. Hey, Doc, pull up a pew. I'd rather not if it's all the same to you. Oh, come on. Ghost story for Christmas? It's perfect! I don't believe in ghosts, and I've no interest in made-up narratives about them. I assure you, Doctor, the events I'm about to recount are not made up. I know that. For certain. Well? Seems like I don't have much choice, do I? So Dick returns with a bottle of Bristol cream. (laughs) <laughs> they sort of bringing us back into their little sit around the tree <laughs> jasper's off still doing his his thing yeah it's like separate he's from he's everyone brought, yeah okay i'll, I'll come down I'll, oh no he's caught up in his he's back to rubbing thing rubbing again <laughs> <laughs> and then this is where we get our explanation of um not explanation, I guess, but some insight into Pierce and Posey when they're asked if they have children. Mm. They give that sort of awkward no. And, okay, there's a, there's a story there. And we get that later on, don't we? But then that's immediately kind of dissipated when Dick offers up a ghost story, which <laughs> Pierce is well up for. <laughs> which I love. Yeah. Yeah, he loves it. And, um, yeah, Jasper is not really up for it to start with. He gives some mealy mouth reasons as to why he doesn't want to hear one. But then <laughs> Pierce sounds very much like his char- the um, Reese's character in Peter Kay's car show thing. Come on! <laughs> yeah. It's really true. Now and again, I watch that. Ghost story I- for Christmas. In fact, <laughs> go on, pump, pump that up. <laughs> yeah, that clip it makes me cry on a regular basis. So good, it is so good. 
It's like this perfect way to set up a ghost story. Yes. And also it, it, it seems aimed at him, like you said earlier. Like there's a sense that this is being aimed at Jasper and there is which a reason is, why we're getting this. And that's met by his response, which is like, seems like I don't have a, have much choice, do I? Mm. And that on reflection feels like a a multi layered comment. The um the phrase I've got written down here is Parkway peaked. <laughs> yes. His interest is peaked. And the, I like the fact the story starts and in and straight away there's a um I'm just gonna I'm just gonna stop you there before you try and pick this apart. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't know it had a. I didn't know it had a torch. <laughs> um, and I also like Posey's segue into the story about a homeless man in the school gym mm. <laughs> inside the vault box, which was nice. I think it was her that played the character in Dinner Ladies, who was quite similar, sort of this simple character who was very mm. caring and yeah would come out with those sorts of stories. Right. That was a long time ago. But yeah, this is where my gap in my notes is as the story started because it is so good. Yeah. And it's so, it like the build up, the actual, the imagery in it being so bleak and horrifying is, yeah. yeah. I don't know. I, I think, I don't think there was a lot of acting needed to be involved to be it was amazing. captivated like, by Simon Callow. Such a great delivery of this story. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I wrote down some of the key points from the story. It's like this figure peeping out from behind the branches, a figure in a dark red cloak, head bowed, I wasn't well, expecting what I saw. It starts to feel a bit like Dick was the figure through all through all yeah. of the beginning of this episode, and he was doing this to set um, Jasper up, doesn't it? Like he's 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 being very specific with all this, and it's weird that Jasper's having premonitions. That I mean, I I guess he's he's looking for Saint Nick. And he and he knows what this figure of St. Nicholas looks like, and that's in his mind. I mean, we've already established we don't really know how this premonition ghost thing works. <laughs> yeah. But it is bizarre that we're getting a ghost story that is setting this up in entirely the same way. He's seeing the same things. Mm -hmm. And that's where it's interesting where you talk about um, Dick having the same experiences later in the episode and possibly before this episode in this church. Hmm. Unless he's just all part of this warning. The way I want to read it is that all of the characters are real. Mm -hmm. They're all there in the way that we kind of receive them. So like, we're not, we're not dealing with any ghosts within the four characters that we encounter. I think that's helpful. Um, oh yeah, I, I don't think it would make sense in terms of them having their own personalities no. and their own their own stories and things that contribute to this and the way that they, they interact were. with each other and yeah, everything like that doesn't make sense. No, um, so I think, I'd, yeah. I think I'd be irritated if they tried to pull a sixth sense on this. <laughs> yeah, no, I think you've got to take them as given. Um. Yeah, and so it's like, yeah, head bowed. I wasn't expecting what I saw. His head slowly lifted up. It was so sad. An old man with kind eyes, but such pain behind them. Below this tender, imploring face, there was no bottom jaw, just a black, lolling tongue dangling down into the space below. <laughs> yeah. That's horrific. Like... So I also, I see the tongue as part of the bottom jaw, <laughs> personally. I think if you're missing your top jaw, your tongue's not there, your bottom jaw, your tongue's not there either. Because it doesn't come down from the top <laughs> into your mouth, does it? Hmm. 
And if your bottom of your mouth wasn't there, it would just hang. <laughs> I feel true. like it comes up. Yeah, so he's telling this story almost... Is he trying to scare... Who's he trying to scare? I think would be the question. I, I think he just likes putting the shits up people, to be honest. <laughs> but why is he there for such a prolonged period of time? This is the thing about the extent to which it's all manufactured, and I guess the... Um, what's the word? Motives. Is he If he's trying to scare him off, I mean, okay, that's fine. Why does he need the other two in there? Unless they're there to try and put him off doing stuff. Is he trying to lure, lure him in to get him to show him where, where the jawbone is? And then... I don't, is he looking for the jawbone and he needs someone else I to I don't find know. It? Someone that's, else who's done all the hard work so he can have it. Is that... Yeah, maybe that's the question. But then why, why does he need the other two there? Unless that is just a side thing where that has just happened and by accident has worked out. Because he could do all of this without them. But maybe it is that he, he, he wants this. He wants it just like um, Jasper does. I mean, he's very prepared to come in and tell a ghost story. Yes. And then, um, yeah, Pierce is so impressed. That was brilliant. I bet that shit you up, didn't it, Doc? <laughs> now you believe in ghosts. Well, why? Because someone's yeah. told a good ghost story. As th <laughs> then he goes into this sort of Nigel Squires from um, uh, Riddle of the Sphinx style, like, we're pattern finding creatures. Mm -hmm. Rationalize what we don't understand. Is ridiculous stories. What pattern? What pattern leads you to that conclusion that you've seen a red cloaked man with his tongue hanging, hanging out of his top jaw? <laughs> oh, it's just a, it's just how you interpret a pattern of events, <laughs> especially as he's seen the exact same yeah. thing that same <laughs> night as well. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like okay, now we're um, we're in the realm of please. I don't want to be like. Yeah. He's almost trying to convince himself as much as anyone else. I at this think point. so. And that's where, yeah, he goes into the sort of, I want to spend the rest of the night in my own company. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that's what he's done for years. And then this scene finishes with emphasis on the bottle of sherry. Pierce wanted to know <laughs> whether that was free. Yeah. So, yeah, we've kind of been through this next scene. Where Pierce weirdly wakes up at two forty three. Um which adds up to nine. Ah, oh, nice. Well done. I see. I wonder where you're going with that. Yes, it does <laughs> add up to nine, right? <laughs> Good call. Um and Posey's awake. And she's just sort of she's sat, very awake. She is very awake. She's sort of just sat with her thoughts, isn't she? And she's lit a candle for Paisley. Um, and this I assume is her the child that didn't make it through the, what turns out to be a motorcycle accident mm. whilst she was pregnant. And this is, this is where the episode sort of starts to, I don't know. We get a bit of explanation of what's been being seen, I guess. And it kind of turns from being a ghost story to something a little bit differently supernatural, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I actually really enjoyed the scene. I think it was really nice. Mm. And it's a really quiet thing. And her delivery was so good when she was talk when she was talking through the initial premonition of her mum crying and then talking about her seeing that same thing at the hospital that I thought there was a glitch and I was seeing the same thing again. Like she's right. she's like it felt like she was bang on with hand against the glass black mascara lines and i guess that was the point but it was it was good yeah. i really liked it but yeah very sad the fact that her mum didn't say i came to see you yeah suggests that she had it was a it was just a glimpse yeah. of what was to come and then it's fascinating that she it was 
I started to dial the number, mm. and that's when the motorcycle came Sorry. off the road, and that's when the accident occurred. Which is where it's like, is it the premonition that causes the thing? Mm. Yeah. Which is really fascinating. Because it's like, okay, if I wasn't preoccupied with calling you, I'd have probably been more aware of the motorcycle coming off the road. If I wasn't yeah. preoccupied with these figures walking around the church, mm. would I end up where I end up? Well, no, because he's led up. He is led up those that staircase, isn't he? I, I thought that when you were talking about this earlier, he ends up up that staircase because he sees that red hooded figure head up that way, doesn't he? He catches a glimpse of them heading up those stairs outside. So that's what. And what's his motivation? What's his motivation to go I don't up know. those stairs? I would. After? I would not want to find. I'd him. be like, uh, probably give that a swerve. Especially then hearing the choking noises <laughs> from the top of those stairs and you're going, nah, this nah, I'm going gonna, gonna to go over these dodgy planks this evening. <laughs> it's, if, there was ever, if there was ever an evening to go over some dodgy planks, it's tonight. It. <laughs> but, but that is the thing. Like, we're, with, with both of these situations, what is leading to what? Yeah. It's, it's not, I guess it comes away from these things being a warning and more of a, yeah, tough luck. This is coming your way. <laughs> and that's the, yeah, and that's the, I think the question around a premonition for me is like, it's an inescapable view of what is coming as opposed to a vision that allows you to change, tack. change it. It's yeah. like, ah, oh, shit. Yeah. I'm fucked. This is like when you hear that um, people who have suffered heart attacks wake up in the morning having a sense of dread that something is going to happen to them. Um, and it often results in, yeah, not results mm. in, often ends up with them, indeed, something very bad happening to them. Yeah. Almost like you know something's coming. This is their bad feeling. And what's even weirder is this idea that her mum almost it's like a two-way thing going on here that her mum had a bad feeling that something was going to happen and then was projected her future reaction to that was then projected to that point there for posy to experience yeah very yeah. odd and then is it just a question of storytelling is that actually something that Posey did experience or is it something that she feels that she almost has a false memory of experiencing after it happened? Mm. Um, and that's her brain's way of rationalizing and spotting patterns and creating a story for herself afterwards. Cause she's woken up in the hospital following a traumatic event. It's very good chance that ha she hasn't completely correctly remembered what happened. So she's got that image in her mind of her mum at the window crying. She's then sort of superimposed that back onto the events of that evening. There's no there's no guarantee that that was actually a thing. Yeah. And have we got a similar thing going on here that there's been some creepy stuff going on? I don't know. What would be the similar creepy thing here? Jasper has, it's, mm, he's had these premonitions of, of himself doing things, but it's not like he's joining something backwards and going, here's a memory that exists that I'm kind of misplacing. Because people misplacing memories is definitely a thing, but he hasn't formed those memories yet to misplace them. Yeah. I don't yeah, know. No, I, I, yeah. It's all over the shop. <laughs> there is no ghost here. I can assure you of that. Ghosts aren't real. It wasn't a ghost. Hello? 
was wanted. I was in two minds about this bit with the flashbacks because part of me, part of me felt a little bit like there's a bit of a bit of over explanation going on here. Um, are we not being enough, given enough credit? But then another part of me, especially now we've talked this through, goes actually no, it needed that. It needed to tie that idea together that that was himself doing these things. I think it would have been a bit too mm -hmm. much to try and make that leap. Cause it was, I, I quite enjoyed the, the quick flashback through all of those events. Yeah, yeah. Of course, the yeah. evening, I think that, I think that was useful. Um, but yeah, it, yeah, he, he hacks out that corner of the wall and he reveals something wrapped in cloth, which we're assuming at this point is the jaw of St. Nick. Yeah. Um, and then Dick just wanders up, finds him hanged. <laughs> goes, oh dear! Oh, oh, well, I never. <laughs> Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! <laughs> Great! What a year! There's there's a man hanging by the neck from your bell tower, and your response is, "Well, I never." Merry Christmas! <laughs> yeah, but that's what I think. That's what makes it seem as though that throughout this entire thing, Dick has had some sort of ulterior motive here. And Dick possibly wants the same, same thing that Jasper does, but isn't willing to put in the work <laughs> that Jasper's been doing with his rubbings. This premonition would finally complete itself this year. <laughs> and here it is. And does that mean lap. he will be at peace? <laughs> Jasper's at peace now. Hello? As always, we'd love to hear from you if you have any uh, reactions to this episode yourself. Uh, any theories, uh, anything that you want to kind of reject accept or pick up on that we've talked about in this episode um get in touch via um email a quiet night inside no nine at gmail.com or through twitter at aqnin9 all right take care have a great christmas see you soon, see you soon. bye bye merry christmas